Number 10, Gucci to the socks. Man of Musa may be the richest human to have ever walked planet Earth. The ninth emperor of the Mali Empire made his massive fortune by exploiting his country's salt and gold production. It is estimated his wealth today would be worth $400 billion US. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of shkarol. It is however difficult to place an exact number on his wealth as this was a very long time ago and it is difficult to separate his wealth from the actual monarch itself. However. In his travels in hopes of securing new trade deals, he wanted to show off his good faith and wealth. When he arrived in Mecca, it was time for a shopping spree, where the wealthy king spent so much gold, it actually ruined the economy. Yeah, it ruined the economy of Mecca. Honestly, that's just a big Bruce Wayne play right there. Imagine spending so much money, you single-handedly raise the inflation rate in a major city. And also a few others. He, that wasn't the only place he did it, surprisingly. He also bragged at one point that gold grows like plants where he's from. Where I'm from, it's super cold and there's lots of snow. We aren't selling snow yet, right? Number nine. Bad Vlad. Vlad the Impaler is Vlad the Impaler. Okay, sure, he wasn't the wealthiest king ever and his empire wasn't that big. But listen, I called the chief last night and he said he ain't it. Vlad was best known for his creative um, punishments to say the least. Vlad was just the kind of guy who took some folks he didn't like and, you know, impaled them with large wooden or steel stakes. Vladdy did not discriminate either. While a lot of poor people did end up with the worst suppository ever, he also ended up unaliving some wealthier folk too. This one time at band camp, Vlad had two guys come visit, and when he asked them to remove their hats, as was custom in Vlad's kingdom, they refused, which in hindsight was a really bad idea, because then Vlad had their hats nailed to their heads, so that they may never remove them again. What were poor people going to do? Try and overthrow the guy who left their family members on pikes as some really weird art installation? Truth be told, I've heard too much about this guy for me to even come close to his kingdom. I'm good over here. I don't need to be anywhere near him. You stay over there, I'll be over here. It's all good. Number eight, Return of the Mac. Okay, so you guys know Rome, right? Beautiful ancient city, monuments, aqueducts, a big scary army with red brooms on top of their heads for some reason. Mamma mia, it's beautiful. But it didn't last forever. After many years of conquest and living well, it eventually decayed and sort of split in half with the west and east. The east becoming known as the Byzantine Empire, which it honestly did pretty well for itself too. This includes the adventures of Basil II. He's nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. For video games out there, Doom Slayer is a big dude in green armor that does what exactly? slays demons. So that means Basil slays Bulgars. Huh? Yeah, real nice dude. With his financial might and power, he was able to conquer Bulgaria, which lasted a long time actually. And by the time of his death, Basil was the wealthiest man in Byzantine. A classic tale of a man in charge exploiting and pillaging those less fortunate. Number 7. Off with his belly. King Henry VIII was a guy known for a few shady things. Removing your wife's head because you want a new wife isn't exactly the nicest way to go about divorce. I could think of some nasty other stuff too. I don't know what the f I'm saying. I think what was rather more interesting, however, was the king's diet and the quality of life divide between royalty and peasants, especially compared to the average person at the time. Sure, he was the king, but the list of foods and menus that were available to him were crazy, even by today's standards, almost rivaling the wealthy of today. His banquets would often include pork, chicken, fish, goose, beef, fruit, bread, and desserts galore. Extravagant desserts with beautiful designs. And of course, you gotta have some wine to wash that all down with, which funny enough might have made them healthier to drink wine since water purification at the time wasn't so great. It is said he was consuming way more than the average person's calorie intake. Also, not to mention his food was fresh, or as fresh as it could be for the time. And if it wasn't, it was seasoned and preserved with very expensive spices from the far reaches of the globe. Spices that no normal person can get their hands on. The average person may not have been starving, but the quality of food and lack of fresh proteins show you what the almighty gold coin can do. Could someone please pass me the turkey? 
Number 6. The Cowardly Lion Richard I was the King of England for a decent amount of time, but didn't spend a lot of time of it in England. He spent most of his time raising taxes so he could fund his international warmongering. After all, that's kind of what history is about. History doesn't usually remember the times we were super friendly and got along. Which brings us to the Crusades. After recapturing Acre in 1191, his enemy Saladin was considering options of what to do next, and also considering uh, prisoner swaps, which actually was common for the time. Sadly, Saladin may have been taken too long, or may have been planning a re-retake of the city, because Richard had waited too long. Not sure what Saladin was up to, he took prisoners from Acre who were poor civilians and soldiers up onto a nearby hill in full view of Saladin and slaughtered 3,000 people. He's remembered for being Richard the Lionheart for his bravery. All I'm saying is that it's not very brave to kill innocent poor civilians. War as hell, I guess. Number 5. Nothing is true, everything is permitted. The Medici family didn't exactly live around the medieval times, but fairly close. That being said, the family is something similar to the Kardashians of today. No, not a hit reality show based around wealthy women who sit around their mansion all day looking for a good verbal argument. No, but rather a well-known family who had extreme wealth and as time went on gained a lot more wealth and power. The Medici got their wealth by being successful bankers. And when you got money, you got power. And they owned a lot of property and had clients in multiple cities. Some family members would later become royalty like Catherine de' Medici, and even more powerful by some family members becoming next to the Lord himself as the Pope. Which if you're into that sort of thing, you would know how serious that position really is. What I'm getting at is, you don't get that powerful without breaking a few eggs. They used money and power to manipulate and they got their way. Number 4. Diaper Sniper All right, this one's messed up, but that's just how things were. Marriage is a beautiful matrimony between two loving people that has a harmonious lasting lifetime. Tell that to people in divorce court and see where that gets you. While we may marry for love today, things were a little bit different back in the oldie times. Marriage was oftentimes a business opportunity or a peace treaty of sorts, and other versions of marriage would have you on a certain dateline show with Chris Hansen. I'm talking about girls getting married at the old refined age of 12. Yuck. It's just how it was. At the time, that was considered the age of maturity, but I mean, if you only live until you're 35, it kind of makes sense, I guess. While most of these cases are from poor people, at the end of the day, they were women and simply could not own business and property that men could. So it's in the best interest that a wealthy man marries a poor girl. Gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. Number three, dyslexia for cure found. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes reading can be really hard. You've seen my blooper reel. I mean, I went to school, I got my grade 10, and that's really cool. Maybe soon I'll be able to go to college and get my PFD. But I wasn't a big fan of school. I just like to hang out with my friends. But then again, I did have the opportunity to attend school. The same cannot be said for poor peasants in the medieval age. Some wealthy kings would go as far as to ban the serfs from learning to read. Wouldn't want your population to be too smart. They might overthrow you after all. And sorry, ladies, that means you aren't going either. Schools were boys clubs. No girls allowed. The richest of families could have their sons sent off to be a squire and eventually enter knightship for their royal throne. But this was for the very rich. I can't help but think that I would look good in all that metal armor though. Give me a sword, a shield, noble steed. Assuming the wealthy would let me go to school. Please sir, could I learn to read? Number 2. Do you require a bowel movement sir? Kings will be kings and sometimes they do some things that shouldn't be things. Meet the royal groom of the stool, a man who must follow the king around with a ye olde porta potty or really just a bull, where he would be ready to assist the royal in a release of his bowels. Originally created by King Henry VIII, the groom's job was to assist the king with a box to relieve himself, also carrying towels and water, even monitoring the outcome of such daily events. After all, he's the king, gotta keep tabs on his diet. It's also rumored that the kings may have even required assistance in hygiene after the fact. Which I mean, come on, I know we all need help sometimes, but that's a tad much. With all the disease and not hand washing at the time, I'm not really sure anyone ate food ever again. Ooh. Number 1. Dead End Job Wiping a royal bum is tough, but cleaving a man's head from his body kinda sucks too. The rich uphold the law and that means when it's time for the death penalty, somebody's gotta do it. Somebody with less money and somebody who might not have a choice as professional unalivers at the time often were handed down the blood soaked acts of their kin. On one hand, you have law and order that is respected. On the other hand, you have a profession that sees law and order through, but is not that well respected. Makes sense that the job kinda sucks though. 
Unalivers often had to practice their skills and eventually worked their way up to the real McCoy. Practicing on pumpkins, animals, and eventually criminals. If they got it wrong, i.e. too many swings at the axe, people would rush and attack their unaliver. Despite what movies and cartoons may make you think, these people did have empathy for what they were doing. And because of their social status, a lot of them lived lonely lives. Number 10. The kitchen. Now that you've got your appetite, let's talk about the kitchen. Major kitchens of the castle usually had to deal with providing at least two meals for several hundred people every day. As you can imagine, this is where the work would be put in. By a large staff too, usually in the hundreds. So you're sweaty from working and surrounded by a bunch of other blokes. Sounds pretty awful. But you didn't take into account the amount of heat. The guidelines on how to make enough food for a two day banquet include the chief cook having to at least have 1,000 cartloads of good dry firewood and a large barn full of coal to keep the fires going. It's spicy in the kitchen, let me tell you. Number nine, the main hall. The idea of a standing army wasn't exactly a thing during the medieval period. So what you would have is your knights or castle soldiers. And unless there was a barracks, the main hall would often convert to have a bunch of cots in it where these soldiers would sleep. It could also be where your guests might stay, and even your servants if you didn't have a room for either of them. And then it became your dining room. It was also your party room, and your courtroom. It was honestly a pretty versatile room. So much room for activity. You could probably imagine the amount of tomfoolery that happened here though. A large group of sweaty men and women after a feast, and they don't have to walk home because they are staying the night. Nice. Number eight, the pooper. The title says unholy, but this room's main purpose is to have a hole. A hole for people to sit their little keisters down on and drop the kids off. Sometimes, down a nice long shaft through the castle that went straight to the cesspit or to the moat. If the moat was a room, I'd probably include it on this list because, yikes. A toilet isn't something you'd actually find in most medieval castles. There are easier places to do your business outside. The garter robe is basically a tiny little closet sized room with a hole in it for this sole purpose. But they were also used for storage, like when you had visitors. You gotta put their coats and cloaks somewhere. Why not next to where Steve is trying to go potty? Number seven, dove coats. You know when you walk down the street and a white colored excrement falls on you from above and you look up? to see a pigeon just looking down on you as if it owns your whole existence? Imagine that, times like two and a half thousand in a circular tower and you've got a dove coat. These structures actually showed off status and wealth as only the lords were legally allowed to have them. Doves and pigeons proved to be an excellent source of food with their meat and eggs. Their feathers were also valuable and yes, even their droppings found use back in the day. Doves even had religious value, being associated with the Holy Spirit. Pigeons, on the other hand, are a menace to society and need to be stopped at all costs. Thank you for listening to my PSA. Gotcha, you little rascal. You were gonna keep watching this video without slapping that like and subscribe button, weren't you? That's fine. I guess you can do that. But gee, we would really all appreciate it if you just gave those buttons a little poke. And then we can poke back with more of these videos. Deal? All right, moving on. Number six, the buttery. I can't believe it's not butter. Well, believe it, sister. This has nothing to do with butter. No, in fact, the name actually comes from beer butts, otherwise known as barrels. The room itself was located pretty close to the main hall, where yeomen would serve beer to the people who were too low in the ladder to be allowed to have wine. And it was usually connected to the beer cellar down below. How is this unholy? Because... I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never done a single holy thing after a few beers. Number five, bed chambers. Do I need to say more? Actually, yes. See, while the bed chamber was the place where the deed was done, those lucky servants that were allowed to actually stay in this room with their lords and ladies often slept on the floor wrapped in blankets and soaking up the heat of the fireplace. The castle itself usually had a cold dampness about it, which sounds lovely. So there were often tapestries hanging on the walls to counteract this. The servants on the floor thing makes me think of when you had like sleepovers and you had to tiptoe through all your friends sleeping on the ground to leave the room. <laughs> Number four, gatehouses. Now for a place with the least amount of holes. Actually, it, it probably had the most. The gatehouse was probably the most fortified structure in the castle. The holes we have here were for the sole purpose of hurling or shooting projectiles. Some were for traps and obstacles. 
The gate house was a house for the main weak spot of the castle, the front gate. And as such, it had to be the most defendable part of said castle. It was also usually the most lavish and ornate part of the castle. If you're inviting Lord Reginald from across the way to your castle, you want him walking through that front door thinking, hey, this guy could absolutely defend against me, but also he has impeccable taste. Number three, the dungeon. You knew this was gonna be here. Don't pretend to be surprised. Well, guess what? It ain't as common as you might think. And it wasn't always a deep, dank cellar in the bottom of the castle. It actually started off as a prison in the tippy top of the tallest, safest tower. Apparently, keeping people in cells wasn't actually commonplace at first. You probably just, you know. But hey, when they did have dungeons, then yeah, they were pretty grim. They were always put in the coldest, darkest, most moist part of the castle. And they were usually just prisons. Number two, oubliette. Bouncing off the dungeon is a much smaller dungeon and hey, another hole. Yep, this one is kind of worse than a latrine though. You see, this is a hole that they would actually put people in. Imagine being put in a hole in the ground where it was too small for you to actually sit down, with a trap door on top, too high to reach. That's an oubliette. The word oubliette is actually from the French word to forget, which is what they do. They'd put you in this hole and then forget about you to die. Lovely, right? Number one, torture rooms. Here we are. Now how many of you weirdos came here for this one? This room is separate from the dungeons usually, not always, but it was at least not very far. Still gotta keep your prisoners cold and dark as you make them squeal for the end, right? Wow, that was dark. This was the room where you'd keep all your favorite tools of the pain trade. Stretched, hung by your ankles, fire, tools of all kind. There were trap doors in some torture rooms too that would lead to dungeons or pools of water. Some torture rooms, like those during the Inquisition, had even thicker walls to keep the screams in. <sighs> some of these torture rooms weren't used as often as you think though as merely having a torture room was enough to get prisoners to give you what you wanted. All right, can we like move on now, please? At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase, hear ye, hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye, 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 which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have 
access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day to day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, Cupbearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. 
Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the ale life was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Ooh.